It is currently 20 to 4 in the morning and I am up because, you know, insomnia. I did try going to bed at like 9pm because I was tired, but then I ended up waking up at like midnight, tried to get back to sleep, rereading Oranges Are Not The Only Fruit, one of my favourites. And while I was reading, I was thinking about this biography. So I was like, while I'm up and excited to talk about it, I'm going to come in and talk about this book. First of all, I thought as a piece of biographical scholarship, it was staggering. Like The amount of research that Heather Clark did was phenomenal. Pretty much every single paragraph, if not every other paragraph, had a quote from something somebody had said and for like a thousand page biography that was really impressive it was the kind of comprehensive look at sylvia platt's life that um she deserves this is not the first biography i've read of hers i've read bit of fame which is the first one i read when i was i think 1920 i read that and i've also read the silent woman by janet malcolm which i think i've also done a review of on my channel I'll link that somewhere if I can find it. But this is a little bit different than the other biographies I've read of Plath because first of all, there's a lot more detail. Secondly, this is quite a big deal that this came out because in previous biographies, the Plath Hughes estate has always been able to, you know, approve what is written about in the biography. So like in this biography, which came out in, was it 79? Anne Stevenson, who was a poet, two years younger than Sylvia Plath. She wrote it, but Owen Hughes, Ted Hughes' sister, basically like co-wrote this with her because she had that much of an influence on what the biographer got to write about Ted Hughes and what they got to write about Sylvia Plath. So this biography, the Plath Hughes estate finally like relented and were like, you can write whatever you need to write. Yes, Which I thought was a great thing that the estate let that happen. But that also means that this book is full of loads of tea. And I've been so excited to do this video and really get into loads of deep tea talk on um, the Plath and Hughes relationship. You know, in literary circles, it's a really famous relationship. But on Booktube, I've not actually seen many people talk about it. So I can't wait to open the can of worms, maybe. But maybe people have talked about it. If if you've seen videos where people talk about their relationship, link them to me or something. So why should you read this book? This book was focusing on Plath as an intellectual and as a political thinker, which I thought was brilliant because um, previous biographies, from what I've read, they were good at showing, you know, what a driven woman Sylvia Plath was. But they, a lot of the time, I feel like the main narrative with Sylvia Plath was that she was just some crazy girl and neurotic. Like, if you mention Sylvia Plath to someone, they're like, oh, that's the one who killed herself. And it's like, she was also, like, extremely intelligent. Um, you know, there was so much more to her than just that. So articulate, very intelligent. She has things to say. She is a woman of substance. And I feel like... A biography that is this long, you really get the sense of how fully she lived. I do think it does Sylvia Plath a lot of justice in that sense. But I also think what Heather Clark was trying to do with this book was defend the criticisms against Sylvia Plath. A lot of biographies, i.e. this, were quite damaging in their perceptions of Sylvia Plath in a lot of ways. Because Sylvia Plath was quite, she could be really controversial and bitchy which I think is really fun but a lot of people Anne Stevenson and both Janet Malcolm who wrote the other Silent Woman biography she wrote that neither of them liked Sylvia Plath but they admired her and in this book Heather Clark was trying to make Sylvia Plath seem more likeable so that I thought was good but yeah if you want to read more about the control that the Hughes family have had over the Plath estate read the biography Silent Woman because that is a short 200 page biography all about how Owen Hughes had control of the estate and how they would try and control everything. That is also good to read but I wouldn't recommend Silent Woman first. Why else should you read this book? It is quite dense but I thought it was dense for the right reasons. Like this book had loads of details on 
Platt's family history. Like, I feel like Heather Clark knows more about Platt's ancestry and stuff than even Sylvia Platt did. Earlier chapters, you know, detail Platt's family history as, you know, all good biographies normally do. So that had some really good surprises. And she also focused a lot about Platt's upbringing because there is this kind of perception of Sylvia Plath um, and Ted Hughes as well, that they were privileged people, um, as if they weren't people that had to work hard for everything they achieved. Um, like Sylvia Plath, um, she came from like a middle class family, like her dad was a Harvard professor, but he died when she was young. So after that, even though her mum was an academic as well, like Sylvia Plath had to share the same room with them. Um, they didn't have much money at all. Like Sylvia Plath wouldn't have been able to go to college and get an education if she hadn't been so driven and remarkable and intelligent and been able to get scholarships. So a lot of the time I feel like there is this perception of Sylvia Plath as, I don't know, like a privileged white woman who gets up on a soapbox. But I feel like you can't come away from this biography without questioning that and see how much these people had to grind for everything. What I also liked is that there were new things in like the Plath archives that have never seen the light of day. Like, there were a lot of Ted Hughes's letters as well, which I thought was really good. Yeah, I think this is a brilliant addition to the Plath biography oeuvre. I took about, I think, over two months to read this book. I took it slow because with biographies, I just like to absorb every detail. I'm a slow reader. So if you're intimidated by its length, don't be too intimidated by it. Like, you can just take it at your own pace. And it was really well written. I do feel like it didn't need to be cut down at all. If you're new to Plath, would I recommend this? Um, for me, I would recommend kind of reading them in the order that I've read them. So first of all, I read this biography and I would actually recommend that you read this first. This is like 300 pages. Like the chapters are quite well paced. It almost reads like a novel, this book. And I think there is a good level of detail in this. But I think you should read this first because Sylvia Plath just comes off as such an unstable bitch in this book. And I don't think you can come away from this book not wanting to know more because you read this book and something just seems very off. Um, because Ted Hughes in this book, his infidelities are never mentioned. Like it's made out like it was all in her head. But we know that not to be true with biography. It's someone writing about someone else's life. So no one can know the 100% truth. So you always have to question that. So I think it's good to read this because it really sharpens you to think about what you're reading and questioning it. So I think you should read this first. And then maybe if you're still really interested, read this afterwards. Because the contrast between the Sylvia Plath depicted in this book and the Sylvia Plath in this book I found almost jarring, and I think it was intended to be that way. I think Heather Clark, she was trying to like ameliorate the perceptions of Sylvia Plath as like a really unstable, sometimes horrible person. But to me, I don't think Sylvia Plath was a horrible person. Um, I think she was brilliant. But in this book, there were loads of times where Sylvia Plath just acted like quite rude and bitchy and sassy and she would be sometimes like inexplicable with how passionate she could be about things like and this is in her journals as well she writes about one day her and Ted Hughes were on a walk in the park and then she just saw these little gals picking flowers and then they were picking all the flowers and this just enraged Sylvia Plath because she was like pick a couple but don't pick all of them you don't need to ruin the whole bush and in her journals she writes that she was like, I wanted to kill them. Like, I want, I could have happily stabbed these girls. And in the journals written by Plath herself, you really get a sense of how intense she was. But in this book, I feel like Heather Clark was always trying to explain why Sylvia Plath acted in irrational ways. And she was always trying to rationalise it. A lot of the time that was done to kind of defend Sylvia Plath. So I could kind of understand that. But sometimes, especially in the last, you know, year of Sylvia Plath's life, in the last couple of months, she was really like falling apart. And some of the letters she wrote, they're just kind of indefensible. And sometimes like Heather Clark would just try to explain everything. And I was like, sometimes people act irrationally and there's no way to try and like explain it. Sometimes people just say things to express their emotions. And I feel like, Heather Clark never quite mastered 
how emotionally, I don't know, unstable Sylvia Plath could be. But it might have also been that because it's such a long biography, you know, Sylvia Plath was such an intense person that it was quite difficult to, like, sustain that level of intensity over a thousand pages. Maybe that was why she wanted to do some damage control in terms of the perceptions of Plath. Let me give you an example of where Heather Clark was just trying to explain how irrational Plath could be and trying to just, like, explain it away. Ted Hughes, like, some mate of his comes over and then they go off to the pub and Sylvia doesn't like that. Like, she wants Ted to stay in the house with her. Here we go. Luke Myers visited Chalcott Square in March, but he spent only one night at the Hughes' flat before retreating to the other Hughes' at 18 Rugby Street. He remembered Sylvia as tense and testy during the visit. While she cooked dinner, he and Ted stepped out to a local pub where Ted, he later remembered, said he had a hard time working through all of Sylvia's interruptions. They returned from the pub to find half-filled bowls of lukewarm clam chowder waiting for them. Sylvia seemed angry and demanding, Luke said in the style of some American women of the period. He apparently was oblivious about why a heavily pregnant Sylvia might resent making dinner while they relaxed at the pub. Daniel Hughes remembered that Sylvia preferred socialising in small, intimate, domestic gatherings. She relaxed. She became herself. The timeless, anarchic nature of pubs, a quality of Irishness, something Ted loved in his younger days, was anathema to Sylvia, with her strong need to feel that everything was under control, even her social pleasure, and with her business-like dedication of her time. Indeed, British pubs at that time were mostly the domain of men, a fact that might also account for Sylvia's preference for dinner parties and explain her annoyance at being left behind by Luke and Ted that night. And that's the end of that little bit. So you read that, and then if you read this biography, this is the same scene, but in bit of fame, it goes like this. When Ted and Luke returned to the flat that evening, Sylvia was, as Myers recalls, standing in the dining space, which was on a sort of rise and staring down at us seated on the couch. What I remember is not the tall, gravid figure, but the eyes boring down at us. When we went to the table, we found three bowls of clam chowder, somewhat less than half full. Ted and I washed and cleaned every crumb and corner, ostentatiously trying to make amends, but it was no good. Like many a wife, Sylvia would have resented the men's going to the pub and leaving her to get supper alone. Yet Sylvia's implacability was extreme, even for a very pregnant woman. Was Ted to be confined to quarters entirely? No doubt it was Luke's visit that prompted a curt remark from Sylvia to her mother on March the 3rd. I really put my foot down about visitors now. I get tired easily and I like the house to myself so I can cook, read, write or rest when I please. I have no desire for people sleeping in my living room or causing me extra cooking or housework. I feel like there were certain scenes where I just think, you know, you really get a sense of how mercurial Plath could be. And I feel like in this biography, that doesn't really come to fruit. For the most part, I thought they were really realistic depictions of Plath. If you've read this book first, without any other Plath biographies, I wonder what you thought of Sylvia Plath. Like, did you think that she came off as a really interesting, witty, passionate person? Or did you think she came off as, like, a dull professor type person? Because I feel like in this biography, she almost comes off as not dull, but she seems more stable she has her breakdowns and she has her emotional peaks and troughs, but on the daily, she was an intense person, but also, like, she could be really annoying. And I feel like in this biography, you don't quite get the sense of her like that. She seems normal most of the time. So as much as this biography is, like, ten times better than this one, I feel like this biography sometimes was better at capturing Platt's emotional complexity. But at the same time, this was still much better. But if I had to reread one of these, I would probably pick this one, just because it's so fun to read. By the time you get to the halfway point, like every other page is just Sylvia Plath acting up at a party or being bitchy. And it, she's just so fun. So fun. Yeah, so what I thought was great was how intimate this biography managed to get in the Plath-Hughes relationship. The portrait of their marriage is done really, really well. And I doubt any other biography will be able to rival that for a long time, maybe. And I did come away from this feeling differently about Ted Hughes. There were certain things that happened in their marriage that I'm like, that is just indefensible to treat your wife like that, allegedly. There's a scene where... 
sometimes she was just so angry and hysterical he would just slap her around the face to just snap her out of it and i was like really you're gonna slap your wife you can't defend that (laughs) allegedly that's what happened allegedly 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 At times like their marriage just seems really idyllic and at other times it just sounds so toxic and it sounds just shocking. I still really respect Ted Hughes as a poet, but I feel like as a husband, you know, I wouldn't want him as a husband. Mm -mm. I can't do a bitch like that. Yeah. They would have these arguments and it would just blow up and escalate but then at other times they were kind of like kids the, the way they ran rings around each other Jesus Christ, what the- <laughs> <laughs> this one scene where listen to this in april they had an absurd quarrel ted accused sylvia of throwing away his old cufflinks coat and book about witches She hated the parts about torture. Sylvia denied it all and ran out of the apartment, sickened. She headed to the park next door, where she sat until she spied him walking along a nearby path. Furtively, she paralleled his course, hiding behind pine trees, wagging their branches with humorous flair until he came to her. So there's some scenes where they fight and argue, and some scenes where they just make up, and it's funny and heartwarming, and you can see how much they adored each other at times. I can understand why some people think they would have got back together even after him cheating on her with Asya. I mean, we'll never know, but I can understand why people think that. So um, it really gets into all the contradictions of their marriage. What was my favourite part of the biography? I would say my favourite part was probably when she was at Cambridge and she was just running rings around all the boys especially for it being like the 50s she was just like a trailblazer um so that was really fun um what else the other part that rivaled that was probably when she i think she'd given birth to one of her kids and then i think she was in hospital getting her appendix out and i just felt like you really got a good sense of her as a person she wasn't totally self-absorbed she was like reading and writing poems like she wrote i think tulips was possibly inspired by the time she was in hospital and if you read that poem it's an amazing poem but you can also understand why some people would call the speaker of that poem self-absorbed and in this biography when she's in the hospital she isn't self-absorbed at all like she's making friends with the nurses she's making friends with the secretaries she's making friends with the other patients you just get a sense of what like a life force she had um so i thought the biography was brilliant in those depictions I feel like my favourite part was when she was at Cambridge because she was leaving the American gal persona behind and she was exploring like a grittier literary aesthetic. After I read this, I did give The Bell Jar another reread as it's one of my favourite novels. So I do want to do a review of this at some point too. Be patient with me. The other thing in this biography was that it really clears up a lot of the misconceptions about her final days. So the last, I would say, 100 pages discuss the days leading up to Plath's suicide. I feel like Heather Clark had a forensic knowledge of everything that was going on at that time. I thought that was really good. What is another criticism that I had of this? There's a lot said about Sylvia Plath that she had racist tendencies. <gasps> like, there's a particularly harsh scene in the bow chart where... Esther just starts kicking like a black guy in the hospital um and this book I feel like Heather Clark in such a long biography she had the means to try and explain that but I feel like she kind of didn't really pay any attention to that so I do wish that she had explained that a little bit but for the most part, she was really attuned to Plath as you know a political and social thinker so There were loads of times where Plath befriended and looked out for people who were of like marginalised groups. She would particularly befriend Jewish people. When she was younger and she worked doing farming work and stuff, 
she would never judge the other people. She would find them just as interesting to be around as, you know, professors at university or, you know, the rich gals at school that were with her who lived in mansions. So Sylvia Plath, I don't feel like Sylvia Plath was racist, but I do feel like there are certain things of the time that don't read well nowadays. Um, but it's a kind of difficult call to make, isn't it? But yeah, how do you feel about Sylvia Plath? Sylvia Plath is one of my all-time favourite writers, probably my all-time favourite poet. I have a printed copy of the Faber Ariel collection there, because it's like the most beautiful poetry cover ever. And I also have her copy of some of her drafts of her poem Elm, which is one of my favourite poems. And I actually snipped that out of this edition of Bit of Fame. That's the other thing I like about biographies. They always come with good pictures that you can cut out if you want. Oh, oh, oh my god, it's fallen to pieces. Oh. Um, yes, very much enjoyed this. My mum got me this last Christmas, so that was a very, very good present. Um, what else? I want to do a review of this at some point, and I also want to do... I also mentioned in another video that I want to do, like, a series where I read through every aerial poem and discuss it, because the aerial collection is, like, probably my favourite poetry collection ever. I also want to do a video reacting to the book A Long List. I hope to do that very soon. Yeah, so thank you for watching. Well, I best get going. Bye. Never make eye contact Everything you got was based off of my contact You a fraud, but I'ma remain icon stat Balenciaga's on my boots with a python strap